Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. All right, welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jake Hall, the manufacturing millennial. Jake, welcome to the podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Spencer. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for coming on. You're the first manufacturing millennial we've ever had in the podcast. So well, good, good. It. I think I'm the only one right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's good to hear that. Yeah, it, is a, it is an interesting time to be in that industry for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I was looking a little bit at your LinkedIn and uh, just trying to do my homework here. And uh, I'm kind of curious how you got into what you're doing, because there's not that many people that have taken like the social media influencer model and applied it to manufacturing. You're the only one that I know of. So yeah, it's, it's pretty <laughs> cool. Like, how'd you come to that conclusion? Yeah, I mean, so the whole thing started back for me. I've, I've been passionate about manufacturing since I was in high school. Uh, 16 years old, got my first manufacturing job working at a custom machine builder at the time, really doing the grunt work, sweeping floors, uh, cleaning out manual mills and lathes and nice. CNC machines, you know, sweeping up the zip ties in the electrical panel shop, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of just the, the grunt work. But, you know, that had me get a lot of experience to see a lot of the cool automation that was being built and designed at that place. And, and that really... Um, set in stone me wanting to go to college get an engineering degree uh better than the field you know like, like i said for like 16 17 years now um what really kicked off the main this idea of being more content creative of being a thought leader you know an influencer there's a bunch of names out there in the industry was um fall of 2019 i was sitting at a conference when it was me and like i would say um, I was one of like 400 people in the audience and, and in that audience, um, you know, I was the only millennial that was there. I was super young. Um, and I said, why is there such a misrepresentation of, um, um, young people in, um, the industry? Like, why is, why is no one wanting to get into manufacturing? Why is it so hard to get people excited to even come to these conferences. And I said, well, I'm a millennial, I'm in the industry. I'm gonna come up with saying the manufacturing millennial because they saw there was such a misrepresentation uh, or a um, such a underrepresentation of just young people coming in the industry. You know, they viewed manufacturing as this dark, dirty, dangerous, dull industry that um, where their grandparents used to work. And, <laughs> and I said, well, I, I wanna you know, change that because I think manufacturing has such a um, a tremendous opportunity for anyone at any skill level, regardless if it's skilled trades or engineering, or you know you're in, you're in a completely different profession. But within the manufacturing industry, there's an opportunity for you. Um, you know, so that's kind of where the idea of the manufacturing millennial came of. I didn't act on it really until spring of 2020 when COVID was just starting to hit the U.S. and um, I was working in outside sales at the time for an automation distribution company and we were told to work from home. And I said, well, how am I going to talk to my customers? How am I going to talk to people? How am I going to learn about what's happening in the industry? And I said, well, LinkedIn seems to be the closest platform in terms of where a lot of professionals in manufacturing, automation, robotics, you know, supply chain are at. I'll just get on LinkedIn and just start posting some content. Um, and, and that's exactly what I did. I like my first, awesome. I would say, you know, 60 posts were me literally sitting in front of a camera talking about one of the products that we offered throughout through as a distributor. And I tried to make it fun and engaging and less salesy, but more entertaining. Um, and those really got some good engagement. And then from there, I started talking more broadly just about manufacturing processes in general. And that got a lot of engagement and attention. Um, so I said, well, there might be something here to, from a social media perspective, drive the impact that manufacturing can have on what our industry is facing. Um, and, you know, fast forward six months, hey, I had 10,000 followers. Fast forward a couple of years, I had 30,000 followers. And 
And it, for me, it was never chasing the numbers, but what it was, it was a um, an understanding of what this industry desires, and they desire to say to, to to have this industry celebrated by people, by content creators, not just me, many of the others that are out there in this industry. Um, you know, to promote to promote what we're doing, promote new technology to. Um, other manufacturers that are out there to have them better understand of how they can be more competitive in a global economy, how they can be more productive, but also how they can change the culture of how they've done business for the past 50 or 60 years yep. and make it more attractive to a more diverse, younger workforce. Yeah, well, and that's that's a very interesting story, and it's awesome to hear it right from the horse's mouth. I, um, I definitely think of every manufacturing shop I've been in as being mostly people over the age of 40, uh, like minimum. And then you see oh, yeah. people way older yeah, that, than that's that. A younger, that's a younger age set right there. But what, what I like about some of the stuff you're doing is I think it appeals to an older demographic as well. Like, you know, some of the, the meme stuff and like, I remember there was one video you sent up which looked really low effort. It was, uh, it was a box rolling up a conveyor or it was, uh, yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was rolling up a conveyor effectively because the conveyor was going upward, the box was falling due to gravity, and the edges were rounded off, and it was the lyrics from Ride and Dirty, which I thought was yeah. very <laughs> clever. And um, I, uh, I just was like, anybody would find this hilarious. Like, I, I sent it to like a fifty-something-year-old engineer I work with, and and he thought it was really, really funny, and probably started following you if he wasn't already. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting style when it comes to creating content. Um, because you you need to understand how do I take my younger mindset of being a millennial, being a digital native, but make that content as relatable to all in all age groups, all demographics within manufacturing. Manufacturing is so interesting because we have the baby boomers, we have the Gen Xers, yep. we have the millennials, we have the Gen Z. So we have like four different generations working in manufacturing together which is just so interesting oh, because yeah. when you look at other industries like um you know the the, the the tech side of where we're at like if it's social media or just <clears throat> big tech companies um you don't see a lot of boomer you know age set or super old on the older side of like gen gen the xers working in that it's a lot of millennials it's a lot of gen z's that the industry but manufacturing is unique in that you know in that circumstance so like when i go out there and i create content or i'm right i'm trying to tell a story or or share something i'm trying to make it to the point of leveraging what a younger what a younger mindset looks at but can be very um i guess you could say relatable to an older generation and cool. You know, like when I'm doing keynote presentations or when I'm speaking at events, you know, that's what I try and do. I try and celebrate the fact that, you know, we have different age groups. We have different ways of doing things. Um, and one way doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. But what we need to recognize is that everyone learns differently. Everyone understands differently and everyone communicates differently. Um, you know, one of the things I, I love when I give a keynote presentation is I talk about how we have changed the way we've learned over the uh over the several past past several decades and you know for me when i went out and i bought my first car when i was 16 years old it was a ford f-250 1996 i bought it for like 900 bucks Jealous. you know which which is a steal in today's terms getting a ford f-250 for 900 bucks <laughs> it's well worth it's a lot worth a lot more yeah, than that awesome. today um but when we bought that car and i, I picked it up um, my dad and I, we drove to AutoZone and we went inside and we got a Hanes repair manual. Remember those? It was like the black and white, you know, repair booklet that if you wanted to know how you fix something, you go in the back and and and, and you search for alternator in the back. It will say, hey, go to page 34. And then you flip to the middle of the catalog and then it gives you a black and white, you know, um, with some pictures, step by step, step step by step instructions of how to replace an alternator in your car. That's yeah. how you problem solve. That's how you learn. Um, so it's like a service manual, what, basically, but from a third party is what I'm getting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. But you know, so you, so you you went to, at the other day you went through a manual. Well, today, if I want to fix something in my car, I don't go and open up a manual. Eric, the I car go guy. To thing, <laughs> yeah, I go to this thing called YouTube. You know, and and I hop yeah. on YouTube and I I Google my car. 
and I Google the problem, and then more than likely someone has a step-by-step -step video that's showing me exactly what I can do. And like the interesting thing and how this ties back to manufacturing is these younger generations, you know, like 20 years and under, 25 years and under, they've never even seen a repair manual before because they've only seen digital content as a way to learn or a way to answer a problem that they have. Like they grew up with this thing called Wikipedia versus when yeah. you and I went to school and we had, we were doing some research study in high school. We had to go to the library's, you know, section and open up an encyclopedia <laughs> and literally look for that topic in an encyclopedia. Like that's how we learned. And I remember um, when Wikipedia was coming out, like my professors and even teachers, cause you know, I might be a couple of years younger than you or I don't even know. But uh, they would distrust Wikipedia. They're like, what is this crap? Like, obviously, yeah. it's not going to work. And so, you know, there was this contention between the generations, as you put it. Yeah, Wikipedia is now like the fourth or fifth most accessed website globally yeah. every day. Um, yeah, that yeah, makes sense. You, you know, People but, bypass uh, Google and just search directly into Wikipedia now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I think that the important thing to take away from that is – when you're a manufacturer and you want to know why you can't get younger people to come and work for you, is it because are you still a manufacturer that's using that old black and white paper repair manual to train your employees, to teach your employees, to allow your, your employees to be um, to, to grow skill sets and to learn? Or are you a manufacturer that's leveraging new digital technology on how to solve a problem? You know, and, and I think it's just one of those things that we need to change from a cultural perspective. And that's why I create content on LinkedIn is to drive more awareness to manufacturers that, you know, just because you might have one of the higher paying jobs out there, doesn't mean you're going to be attracting a future workforce. It has to do with the culture of your company. It has to do with the impact that your company is creating. And it has to do with what are you doing to help propel your employees, their own individual careers forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's kind of like, you know, what my mindset is when it comes around creating content is how do I make it, make it relatable to younger generations? How do I still acknowledge the older generations? And how do we create a common ground that, um, you know, we all share this passion for manufacturing? Yeah, that's awesome. One of your posts I really, really liked was the one where you just showed the different wage rates for like, you know, PLC programmer. And I can't remember yep. what the hourly was, but I feel like at least when I was a kid, like nobody told me how much, like I'm a robotics engineer. So nobody told yeah. me how much a field robotics engineer makes versus like a doctor versus a lawyer versus a mechanic versus, you know, a dump truck driver versus a convenience store clerk. Nobody ever gave me like a lookup. And I'm I you know, I think if I'd have had that, I might've made some different decisions, maybe still ended up in the same place, but via a different yeah. route, you know? And so I, I don't know. I, I like what you're doing, spreading data and, you know, just giving people like, Hey, look, this is, this is what it is. And, and I think, you know, with that as well, you know, if I go back to that post that was really promoting this idea of skilled traits, you know, with the idea when I was in high school and we were, you know, we each had our 15 minute meeting with our guidance counselor to discuss what do we want to do after we graduate? Um, there was never a discussion like of skilled trades being promoted as a, as a career opportunity uh, for young kids. It was like, so what, what university are you going to go to? Like, so I'm in Michigan, like basically my guidance counselor laid out and said, okay, you can go to Grand Valley, Michigan, Michigan state, Purdue, you know, OSU, Illinois. Like she just picked like a bunch of the big schools within the Midwest. Sort of the nearby. <laughs> yeah. And said, this is what, you know, opportunities are. And like, and, and I chose, I, I chose the engineering route and I have no regrets doing with it because for me, it's benefited me really well. But for a lot of people, a four-year degree, one, might not be the most economical decision for them, but also um, it might just not fit who they are personally. Oh, yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's so many professional skilled trades out there. For being like a robot programmer, you know, for, for, for you or like a mechatronics, you know, degree or a PLC programmer or a machinist or a machine operator – there's yeah, so maintenance many tech. I mean, there's some yeah, people that are so good tech. with their hands that are just geniuses in that way who are, are just born to fix machines or figure out what's going to go wrong before it goes wrong or create a yeah. maintenance schedule. And I mean, that's the guy I want on my team, you know, 100 percent of the time is the one that, you know, bleeds, eats and sleeps motor oil. 
know? so exactly and and i think that's what you know we look at in terms of um trying to drive awareness to you know you don't need a four-year college degree to be successful with whatever career choice that you make um and, and I think the one thing about that as well is like within manufacturing, um, you know, my, my day job where I work for a company at a- ATS Global, um, we have some of our senior engineers didn't even go to college. You nice. know, they went and they got an apprentice journeyman's electrical degree and then they got their, you know, their mass, their, um, their, uh, their their master journeyman and then they started doing more panel build and schematic designing and layout and then that got them into some addressing some um plc you know stuff and maintenance and now they're a full-time programmer and like that's the one thing that i just love about this industry with manufacturing is you have as a young person by putting in time and by creating a sense of effort and drive you have the ability to grow uh, to grow within the industry um and and be whatever whatever position of leadership that you want to be uh and i think that's just what makes manufacturing so exciting it's like you don't see that in like retail right you know you're not going to be a you know a retail worker doing as a cashier's checkout and eventually being the vp of Walmart. Maybe you are. You know, I'm if sure you're really, really people. good. I, I don't know. I don't know enough people that work for Walmart corporate to have a strong answer to yeah, that. But 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 you know what you do see though. You don't see it frequently in deep tech, facilities. unfortunately. Yeah. Like at least where I work. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just no. I'm trying to bounce off it here. And I do a lot of work on like deep technical robotics problems. So there's some of these startups, the tech companies you'd mentioned and it's sad, but what you're saying is kind of true, which is you sometimes see it. You'll see people without a degree that are, you know, ascended to senior engineer or executive. And you're happy when you see that, or I'm happy when I see that, because, you know, it's like, all right, well, that person kicked ass and did a good job and got promoted to their own merits. And, you know, that's probably somebody that knows a thing or two. Yeah. But it sounds like from what you're saying that, that that's just way more common in manufacturing than in other industries you've seen. Yeah. And I think that's just what's so exciting about it is the, the potential and the opportunity that manufacturing offers, uh, you know, it's uh, it's workforce. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, and I mean, kind of like I said before, like if somebody is, you know, hardworking and, and intelligent enough and reliable enough to just do a good job on whatever they're doing every day. I mean, that's who I want. I don't care where they went to school or how good their grades were. I care, like, what's the last panel you put together? You know, what's the last, you know, robotics algorithm you figured out? What's the last, you know, thing you got into market, you know, one way or another? And so that's that's what interests me. Or, you know, yeah. I guess, you know, maybe I'm a little bit old school. I also care about, like, do you show up on time, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Are, are you fun to work with? You know, can you can you yeah. take a joke? <laughs> like, there's, there's, there's a few yeah, things yeah, that I, just make personable? the work day. Yeah, personable. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess when you create content, um, do you typically make it based off of just what you would find interesting? Do you look at metrics for what did well in the past? Is it some combination of both? Um, yeah. Or something I else mean, entirely? So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, when, when, when I'm out there and, and I'm, I'm creating content, I want to find something that I think, you know, can do two things. It's, it's either one, it can, it's, it's, it's showing how we're solving a problem in the industry. And, you know, the highlight of the product comes second. The other thing that I look at is, is it relatable to people? So, I mean, I would say those are the two things that I look at, Spencer, is can it, is it showing a problem that we're solving or is it relatable to a, a person? And, you know, that is the type of content that I always like to say is, can it educate them? Can it excite them? Is this something that they would want to, share around a group of friends, you know, who might not even necessarily be in the industry, but they just say, this is fun. This is exciting. This is something that, um, I, I learned, you know, it's kind of the inspiration, yeah. a little bit of like micro from dirty jobs. What I, you know, is, is a big inspiration of mine. And then nice. also, um, like, you know, a little bit of like how it's made, you know, it's nice. Like, yeah. Big know, fan of both of those. You know, like a uh, what I would call, you know, the how it's made, but 
you know, in terms of like social media, right? The idea is, is I want to, when I'm on social media, I'm compa- I'm competing for people's time and attention and um, their focus. And like, so when I'm out there and I'm creating a, a piece of content, I ask myself, can I, can I engage with them? Can I educate them? And can I excite them? And like the first 30 seconds of that post, you know? And, and so for me, it's, it's, that's what I would say is my recipe for creating content is that type of a focus. That makes a lot of sense. Is it, is it engageable? Is it excitable? Um, And, you know, do they, do they learn something from it? Yeah. Okay. So you want something that's engaging, educational and fun. Yeah. People might want to show their friends. Now, do you show it to your own friends first before you post it usually, or do you just ship it? Next one, see how you know, it does, and like rinse there's, and repeat. There's always there, there's always posts that like I have a group of of friends. We we call ourselves the manufacturing mafia. Nice. Um, there's like 15 <laughs> of us content creators that are out there. That's awesome. And you know, I'll I'll bounce some ideas off of them to like get their gauge. Like, okay, is this too political? You know, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Do you find this exciting? You know, I try and do my best to keep politics as much as I can out of it, you know, or is it a little bit too like risque as as what I would call like, for, for example, today, um, today's Valentine's Day is the day that we're recording this. If yep. you guys are listening to this, and, it'll come and out today, weeks later. So that's what it is. <laughs> um, and, and today I made I made a post around the manufacturing process of condoms. You know, obviously, nice. yeah, that's romantic. Valentine's Day, a lot of times something happens on Valentine's Day. And I thought, well, what would be more fun to share how condoms are manufactured? And like each year, there's over 450 million condoms that are manufactured from latex. Well, let's talk about the history of it. Did you know that at one point in time, condoms were actually made out of sheep intestines? I did know that. And, they still are if you're and, allergic to latex. Yeah. You know, you know, so like for me though, it's, it's, it's cool to show this manufacturing process. It's cool to see how, um, you know, this type of thing is manufactured at such a large, massive scale. Um, and, and, and so like, I think that's one of those things that, you know, I always get feedback on and say, okay, is this a little bit too risky for LinkedIn, you know? And, and so far it's, I mean, that doesn't seem bad. Did you get any blowback from the condom post so far? No, I mean nothing. No, a lot of a lot of very funny puns. Um, nice, <laughs> you know, regarding uh, regarding it. But you know, they, I, I made this post four hours ago, and right now it's sitting at eighteen thousand views. Nice, That's you know. Awesome. So like, so for for me, it's like okay, you know, it's fun, it's engageable, it's competing a little bit with the post that I made yesterday, um, which is the joke between, hey, if there's a problem on a machine, do you blame electrical or mechanical engineers? Yeah, I've seen that you know, meme a bunch, you know, but. I actually always did admire your ability to like rebrand like a classic meme like that. So I've seen that it's it's uh, for people listening and, and not watching or even if you're watching, I guess we can probably put it up on the screen. But it's uh, the uh, what the fuck are the characters names again? Yeah, uh, so it's so Bugs Bunny it's, and, Bugs, and, and thank Daffy, you. Daffy, Duck. Daffy Duck. And they're pulling the rabbit season, duck season, rabbit season, yeah. duck season. But the one says mechanical problem. The other one says electrical problem. And if you've ever worked on an interdisciplinary team, that is all too true. <laughs> And usually there's someone else that says it's a software problem, which is yeah, how the comments that's, light that's up. The, <laughs> yeah, and that's the feedback that I got from that one. So I've already, you know, I'll, I'll go back and I'll take this post and I'm going to edit it. Uh, you know, so when I when I use this post again, um, I'll probably add software, electrical problem, mechanical problem, software problem. Um, you know, and, and, and the whole idea is once again, you know, right, the older generations – remember looney tunes right they remember watching this as a kid or when they were growing up so when you create a comfort that's relatable and then you make it into related to their industry it just performs you know really well so like this post With everyone is, yeah that makes sense yeah like this post right here to look at it's it's over a hundred thousand people have viewed it and you know the last 24 hours how do you that's that's awesome by the way that's is <laughs> way better than any of my posts have ever done so I guess with that one in particular, if I can go specific, like how are you thinking of making that ternary? So if you get like software, mechanical, electrical, I feel like it loses some of its charm of just being two things that these two characters are fighting yeah. over. Well, and I then you also say, rob the viewer of the satisfaction of knowing something that you didn't catch. 
like yeah. ah software you, I'm you so know smart. And, and so like that's a whole other thing too <laughs> yeah. is like how do you you know you almost like when i try and do posts i try and make it so someone always has to go in and like add something else right because from smart. a from a analytics perspective comments create engagement which creates linkedin pushing my posts to more people that's very um, clever so you know you want people to comment so like from here i i you know at the end of my little post um i said so who is right well everyone always has their opinion <laughs> you know so um you know they added on there and you know a lot of these posts were software as well so like you know i'll go out there i'll have the electrical problem I'll have the software problem but i'm pretty sure in this scene i'd have to go back um who's the hunter what's his name again elmer um, fudd yeah, you know, I want to say he also pulls it down when he is out there because he's deciding who to hunt. Oh, maybe good point. I'll, maybe I'll have Albert Fun come down, and at the end of it, you know, instead of just this continuously moving GIF, we do a little bit of that. But then Albert Fun walks in and he pulls it down, and then he points at it and it says "software problem" at the end of it. You know, that's just pretty to clever. have that type of, you know, and that's like the, what I'm, I'm always looking for feedback from the people who create uh, the people who create content, but also the people who interact with my posts, you know, to try and create the best content that I can. And like you, you can see from when I originally created content like two years ago to where I'm at now, I, I've, I've shifted and I've designed the way I, I present content. I highlight talk content. I talk about posts in the industry or, topics in the industry i've shifted on how i do that depending on feedback that i've got or this post does really well and this perform this post doesn't perform very well um i you know go why did this one do really well why did this not one not do really well how do i replicate better the ones that do really well versus how could i change the post that didn't do well because i'm still very passionate about the story that i'm trying to share how would i make that more engageable so that's it's, interesting it's, it's, it's that constantly it's that you know and constantly playing with you know the linkedin algorithm as well um that's the elusive you know, one <laughs> you know and, and and all of that stuff but it's it's a lot of fun um you know especially when you know each week you're engaging anywhere between you know half a million to a million people a million views a week you know each week on my content so it's a nice. lot of fun it's a lot of fun to see that how do you recycle posts that you were passionate about that didn't do well without cannibalizing the new post? So yeah, say, I, I mean, okay. so 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 yeah, great great question. Well, um, thanks, buddy. You, you know, a, a lot of a lot of the times is okay. Is there a different format that I could put it in? Like, right? If I was um, sharing it via an image before, what if I added motion to it and made it into a GIF? So there's more animation to it. What if instead of um, what if I change the the first sentence of that post? to make that post more engageable. You know, uh, there's a million different things that you can play with to figure out why did that person not want to stop and like and comment or share and engage in that post and, you know, play with it a little bit. And and I I think, you know, for the most part, it, it works out pretty well that way. How many iterations do you get like that before it sort of just becomes like a dead concept and you can't you can't get any more? Oh, I, I mean... It's hard to say. Fair enough. Um, I, I truthfully don't know that. I mean, for me, when I want to say, and let me look at this real quick. Um, I have my sheet pulled up. Yeah, so starting in, so really starting in the beginning of 2021, I have made a post every single day on LinkedIn. So like well over now a thousand posts. Nice. Um, you know, consistently every single day so you know after you do that and you kind of get into um the um so multiple a day it would have to be to hit those numbers yeah yeah because yeah. because you know i've done it for you know at least two and a half years plus going into 2023 uh but yeah i mean sometimes there was there was posts that were a couple times a day maybe it's maybe it's not a thousand maybe it's closer to like 800 900 got posts. it okay but, you know um you know the 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 one thing for me though is like when I'm out there and I'm doing content, um, you know, I try and not make more than like one post a day on LinkedIn, just because um, I want to be able to make sure that the post that I'm sharing has enough time to be able to reach the rest of the audiences. Because like with social media and LinkedIn specifically, I believe that LinkedIn's always going to push to your most 
latest piece of content. And if, um, you know, you make a post and then two hours later you make another post, that post you made early in the day might not get as much traction or might not get as much likes and engagement because you've already shared another one. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So it's uh, it's interesting in, in that style playing with it, you know, that way. Yeah, and I, I've definitely seen that happen if I've tried to put out a few posts in a day. It's just they all kind of do crappy. And you're like, ah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's what I would look at is, um, you know, when you're creating content, go in there with a strategy of, um, you know, not just trying to post a million things, um, you know, go in there and, and find out what you're really passionate about and try and make up, you know, a, a narrative around that, if that makes sense. How long do you typically spend kind of coming up with a post? Like uh, some of the animations are pretty. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it all depends, right? You yeah. know, um, some posts can literally take me five minutes, 10 nice. minutes. <laughs> um, awesome. And then some posts can take me several hours you know, depending on like what it is like. So last week I um, released a manufactured in Ohio post where I was highlighting Ohio manufacturing. Cool. And, you know, I did a full infographic on that, um, did a bunch of research, looked at like five or six different, um, you know, research companies out there, everything from the, uh, the uh, national uh, Association for Manufacturers, the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, um, the Ohio Manufacturing Organizations, and, you know, and finding something like that, um, you know, can take uh, several hours to find yeah, the information, sense. to document the information, to make the infographic. There's a lot to it. But, you know, something like that is is really exciting to do. You know, I'm pulling that one up right now. Um, you know, and that post performed extremely well. Nice. You know, and like that's that's the goal is is you know, for me it's like let's celebrate Ohio manufacturing and you know uh, a few weeks before that I did Michigan and and I think tomorrow or the following day I'm going to release one on Wisconsin and my goal is to nice. just came more back and more there. and more states you know on you know what what each one of those has to do to celebrate for manufacturing. That's awesome. Yeah, and Wisconsin's definitely got it going on. I'm not biased at all, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's a great you know, Wisconsin, Wisconsin has a lot of cool stuff. You know, yeah. they they have um, their their leader in a lot of areas of manufacturing. Their leader, you know, obviously the leading uh, cheese producer out there. But you know, a lot of other cool stuff, right? Like the the first mass produced typewriter was made in in manufacturing and keyboard was was. Dude, made in I did not know that Harley Davidson yeah. too, right? Is is a Wisconsin product? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you know the um, uh, the tractor started in Wisconsin. Seriously. Uh, yeah, Dude, and, I did you know, not know and, that. And, 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 there, and there's a lot of other cool stuff, and, that, and that's the whole one. Like, that's why I love creating content because I want people to be proud of. Hey, look what your state's done. Look how you know your state's contributing to manufacturing. Yeah. Um, well, even you know, when you look at the beer industry, there, I mean, it's it's fascinating. Like, I had some friends that worked for some of the breweries, and the larger breweries will do fulfillment now for microbreweries. So you can give the large brewery, like I can't remember. I think it was whatever one of the big ones is in Wisconsin, uh, but they'll have fulfillment recipes. So you as a little microbrewery, send them your recipe. They'll brew it in one of their big tanks and then they'll ship it for you. And yeah, you know, all you have to do is give them the brandy and the recipe and, you know, maybe inspect it now and again. So it's, it's just really cool to see some of the stuff that's come out of that culture. Yeah. You know, like, so like, well, like talking about Wisconsin, for example, since you're from there. So yeah, the typewriter was, I lived it, there for was, six months. <laughs> oh, you say yeah. for six months, you know, the typewriter, uh, the tractor, modern toilet paper was made, was first mass made in Wisconsin. Um, the supercomputer was first manufactured in Wisconsin. Um, the number one sector is food and Bev one in six people in Wisconsin work for a manufacturer. 87% of exporters are, from small manufacturers in the state of Wisconsin and the number one state for cheese production, That's you know, awesome. and, and they have a lot of cool stuff as well. You think of like Kohler, um, Rockwell automation, Johnson controls, Johnsonville yep. for your brats, uh, Briggs and Stratton, right? There's a lot of cool yep. things. Badass so motor goal, makers. <laughs> you know, so my, my whole goal over the next, yeah. you know, year is to highlight a lot of these states. Um, you I worked know, for just uh, Joy Global while I was there myself making mining vehicles. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, and that's just the big thing is, you know, I want people to be proud of 
the industry that they're in. Um, and I think if people outside our industry look in on us and they say, wow, what are, why are they so excited? Why are they so passionate about it? Um, that will hopefully drive younger generations to come to our industry. Because right now, you know, we're facing, I think we have like 700 to 800,000 open jobs in manufacturing right now in the U.S. Sounds about right. But by right. 2028 to 2030, we're expected to have almost over 2 million unfulfilled jobs in manufacturing. PLC you programmers know, are going to make so much money in those years. <laughs> it's going to be you printing know, money. So, so um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, um, yeah, it's just I – I'm so excited about getting other people passionate about manufacturing and when I can share content like this and people like it and engage with it and they say, oh man, thanks for putting this together. Thanks for sharing. You see other organizations do it and it makes me really happy. Um, so other people can also, you know, be passionate about this industry that we're in. That's awesome. Are you starting to see people coming into the industry that have like, thank you personally for, for coming in? Oh yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've talked to, you know, this, this goes all the way back to uh, when I was a mentor for first Lego League. Yeah, like I was a first mentor like too. 2008, <laughs> 2009, and I was mentoring middle school students. Well, those middle school students, you know, they're adults now with families and kids. Uh, but, you know, they went to school or they went in skilled trades. And, like, you know, I know guys who work for NASA now that I was a mentor for when they were in high school. And now they're, you know, working at NASA or they're doing systems engineering for rockets for SpaceX. Or I'm very proud of my students. <laughs> you know, you know, so like for me, it's just like that direct impact. And, you know, from and and, you know, going back to my local university and my alma mater and, and speaking at there and then seeing them graduate and then reaching out to me and then saying, hey, do you know this? I'm moving to Florida. Do you know anyone? And I connect them with a local company in Florida. Now they've been there for like several years. It's oh, like, that's awesome. That That's what is so fulfilling and rewarding to me is just to see all these other people's success that they've had. And I've been, you know, I've been a very small portion of helping them get you know, to that area. And, and I think that's what creating content can do. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So you're taking that individual feeling you get when you mentor someone and you're scaling it way up Yeah, and trying to bring it to a wider audience. That was great. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> trying, trying to create talking points for other people. So when they have those questions, you know, like the idea that automation just destroys jobs, you know, how do we, how do we better, educate ourselves so when people bring up those points you know we can say no automation doesn't destroy jobs it creates jobs it creates stability it supports local domestic manufacturing you know on on a a nationwide scale um you know i, I think that's just stuff where what the general public views as robots in the industry is not what the truth is when it comes to how important and critical they are to u.s manufacturing it's the only way we exist as a manufacturing nation. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think people are like, well, gosh, your automation. What about those people's jobs? It's like, listen, the only way this small to medium sized manufacturer who employs 80 people can stay competitive in a global economy where those same exact parts can be produced for pennies on the dollar overseas is for them to automate. And produce yes, them for pennies on the dollar it, here. <laughs> yeah, you know, and is is every single person going to have the exact same job when automation comes? No, absolutely not. But what we are seeing is automation is what I would say is a common denominator for a global economy to allow domestic manufacturers here in North America to keep jobs here and to bring jobs back. You know, and, yeah. and, and we all saw the massive... Um, impact that you know covid had the pandemic had on the u.s supply chain yeah it was and, brutal even on the job know, market it was weird to see how many people just you know kind of withdrew oh yeah we're still not we're still not back up to numbers you know amen to that <laughs> you know post post uh pandemic but that's why automation robots are so critical to supporting u.s manufacturing it's the and, only way and, to fill that vacuum oh 100 100 because we're a consuming industry we're a consuming culture um, and we need to make stuff in order for, you know, in order for us to consume it. So, yep. And export it. Yeah, exactly. All right. I think we're, we're at a good stopping point. Uh, Jake, I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything you want to plug while you're while you're still here? 
Yeah, I mean, the one thing I would I would say, Spencer, is you know, if you're if you're at a manufacturing company or you're at an automation company or something like that, you know, I would always encourage you reach out to your local community colleges, or your local schools, um, your local universities or skilled trades programs, and figure out how you as a manufacturer can get involved and how you as a manufacturer can begin to not only um, impact you know the future workforce but invest in them. And, and understand that those are your future employees that you're investing in. And, um, you know, the, by, by investing in the local skilled trade jobs and the local skills that you, are, you as a company are looking for, uh, you are going to benefit long term by doing that. That's a great outlook. <laughs> I really like that. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Um, if you're listening and you work for a manufacturer, Get people apprenticeships while they're in trade school. Get them young. You'll have a great workforce in a few years, probably even sooner than later. And uh, Jake, thank you so much for having on, coming on. This was a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks so much, Spencer. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.